Hey, Jamie. How are you doing? Almost Merry Christmas, Kurt. Oh, well, well, am I Santa? Yeah. Do I look like Very, Santa? You're like super festive. I got, you know, we'll try, this will be out by Christmas. So yeah, got to showcase my, my wife's handiwork, a handmade knit hat. Beautiful. Keeps, keeps this hair, this, this hair warm. So yeah, or lack as, of hair. as we have been talking about in, in the last couple episodes. So what's, what's the, what's the temperature differential? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me, let me double check. You want, I'm going to give you, what's the, I'm going to give you the feels like as well. Right. So it is 24 degrees right now with the wind chill is in the single digits. It's cold. It's, it's so here, here's the relative. So if you, if you went outside with a sweatshirt, even within a minute, you're going to start feeling that cold air it, right through into the hitting that hitting that body so yeah so i don't go outside too much right now yeah. still still born in montreal i do remember oh yes like <laughs> the concept though have chosen right to not to not well how how what's 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 the temp down so i'm not in austin i'm in dallas but again texas weather we started out with a balmy 39 degrees this morning so that was fun walking, walking the dog, but we're now we're up to <laughs> 66 degrees this afternoon nice. as we're recording this. So Texas, I'll take, uh, uh, I'll take 40, I'll take 40 and, and sun right now all day. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> but one thing we passed the solstice, the winter solstice, yeah. which is, is, I, I, I tip it's, I, I pretty much say it's my favorite day of the year because I I don't really like when the days get shorter. And so now the days start getting longer and it's optimistic, hopeful. Well, because the, the winter returns. solstice, yeah. Cause the winter solstice is officially the shortest day. Yes. Yes. And it's all about the tilt of the earth the tilt to the earth. And I think it's, the North Pole tipping away from the sun. That's right. I this is where I teach my students in okay, uh, good in HVAC. It's the first week. It all it all comes solar, back to me. Solar geometry. Yes. 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 Do you, what yes. angle the Earth, Earth is tilted at? <sighs> Why don't you? Well, go ahead. The quiz. This is a quiz question. Twenty three and a half degrees. I was going to say 32 and I knew it was wrong. So oh. yeah, that that's good. Well, you had the right numbers in the wrong order. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, so let's talk about what we're drinking and then I've got some, some cool news. Let's just say, so you go first, enlighten us. So, so today is I, I, I brought some of my maple pecan coffee northward, but then I brought, I brought some other stuff too, that I'm going to try and introduce my, my, my pop to. So since he's usually the one who drinks the coffee with me, so nice. it'll be fun. Sounds good. So I, I swung by a place. I had to go pick up some drawings from our, my local printer to take to a city building department. So on my way, on my way away, or <laughs> on my way away, on my way to the office, I it almost by. sounded Canadian there for just a minute. Way you away, like, yeah, it was like, am I having an influence? So probably we do. We we've doing we've doing we've been doing this long enough. Yeah, it's like almost a hundred episodes. Uh, yeah, very close. Very exciting. So there's a place called Oliver Tees, which is kind of a neat little boutique grocery that has a very well stocked liquor shelf, but also roasts different bean uh, combinations. So I got a little bag of maple bourbon coffee beans. Really? Yeah. Maybe I should ship some down your way. I should. I think not a maybe. I think I will. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> looking at those, looking at that, the stare in my direction, I think, I think it's a, it's a must have. So it's, so what's fun. the verdict? I mean, what's the verdict on it? It's good. It's not over the top either maple or bourbon, but you do smell the, the maple flavor, which is probably, I think the, the highlight part for me being mm-hmm. a fan, of, being a fan of Canadian people and things Canadian like maple syrup, <laughs> then I think you'll like it too. Okay. How's that for a review for <laughs> I, 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 a new flavor? I will take that endorsement but and, and run with it. Yeah, it's a new, it's a, a change of pace. Fine. So, so one thing before we jump into some sketches here is I, I've mentioned to you offline of this, this Discord server, this community, this online community that I've been hanging around during this pandemic. That's called Archimarathon. And the leader of Archie Marathon, Kevin, he he has also has a YouTube channel called Archie, Archie Marathon. And so <clears throat> for those that are aware of how Discord works, you can, anytime you upload something to YouTube, you can have it automatically uh, pop up an announcement on the server. And so because he is aware of Coffee Sketch Podcast, he has added us to the list of his automatic notifications. So anytime we publish something, it will now be announced to the server without me having to, you know, self-promote. Yeah, raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> so that that's just a little, little Christmas gift to Jamie. Oh, that's fantastic. So you, so you yeah. now, so he also then said, time to raise the bar. <laughs> <laughs> So here's us raising the bar. Yes. So yeah, no pressure, but no uh, pressure, but we are heading into triple digits. We're soon fast approaching a hundred episodes. So I think it's just another milestone for us to, to take things to another level. So, well, so, and, and, and I think, I think you, you were, you were remarking and, and, and I think both of us were sort of thinking about it as well is that the, the, the video ones really have, have forced us to think through what we're wanting to talk about a little bit differently and and try some of the stuff that we've been sort of experimenting with in a little bit more deliberate fashion so yes we will do some live sketching and in the coming year i mean that's which is only like like a week away two weeks away i know know, this very fuzzy part of the calendar mr winter solstice Um, (laughs) but yeah but I, i i'm looking forward to that i think that'll be a fun uh, a fun way for us to both of us were talking about it at, offline as well was this the the idea of being able to draw and talk at the same time mm-hmm. and and that that's that's a skill that's rarely discussed but it's one that certainly exists and it's one that you and I both enjoy doing mm-hmm. i think maybe that maybe that's sort of the educator in us kind of a foot in academia a foot in practice like to you know help explain and so yeah, i think a yeah, communicating uh, tool yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah yeah well i know i know i i have a a workable rig to use a little youtube tech term that potentially can record me drawing not necessarily record my face and my hand but hey i have i have a potential workaround now jamie i think needs to make certain technology upgrades to get there i i have been my my christmas my christmas gift to you is that i have been working on a different setup because there's also like a practicing Mm -hmm. and comfort level thing like we don't want this to be like a dumpster fire and and, i mean that would be bad so there is that because as you say we're upping our game that's right. So yeah. So we will. I we're mean, not like in relegation. Like we're not going to get relegated to like the lower leagues and the lower divisions. We're going to try and you know. <laughs> That's right. Move up the table. That's right. D one. D one's yes. on our on our radar. But yeah, and obviously you're on on vacation right now, so we will we'll, we'll look forward to that. But lots of sketching. That's right. Yeah. Which. 
is what should be done on vacation. And actually, my goal, a little mini goal, mark the tape, is to try and take a little time off too. And and I have been sketching actually, but I, what I need to do is post the pictures, the evidence. <laughs> It's like a, if a tree falls and no one's around to hear it, if a sketch is drawn and it's not on Instagram, is it even a Did sketch? Did it really happen? Did, Did it, it really, really happen? <laughs> so let me segue away from that before I get myself in, in trouble. But let us pick our sketch that we were going to start with, which is a good, I guess, a, a, a current event, prescient moment. So this is, well, I guess it's been about a week, what, 12, 12? So Jamie drew, well, you have to explain this better, but and then we can talk about the technique a little bit, but pulling from the hashtag of rest in peace and interview with the vampire, I make assumption that you're paying homage to Anne Rice, who recently passed away, the author of uh, Interview with a Vampire. Yes. And so, yeah, I, I just, I was always fascinated with her, with her works and I, I really enjoyed, I got introduced to them kind of late in high school, like early college. And so voraciously tried to read as many of them as there were that were coming out. And then there, at this time, they were also sort of transitioning into converting some of them into movies too. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things, but I mean, but the original book, Interview with the Vampire, I didn't remember the exact year, but in reading her obituary and sort of tributes to her, it sort of refreshed my memory of when it was written. It was written in the 1970s, like 1971, 1972. Um, and it was really kind of her first first novel uh, of that length and, and a breakout work for her, obviously. But it was, they, she was living um, with her husband in San Francisco at the time. And they had just lost their daughter, who mm -hmm. was like four or five years old. And, and so if you're familiar with Interview with the Vampire and sort of some of the characters in it, there, there's a young girl in it, a uh, young child, and sort of there, and is, she's turned into a vampire to, at, at a young age. And so they're sort of trapped in that body for, for so long. And I think a lot of people were kind of like, oh, that's, that's so unique and strange about some of these you know, characters that, that are kind of in her work. And when you look at you, you, you write which that kind of old adage. And I think that was sort of her, from what I've read is that it was her dealing with grief a bit and, and sort of one of the things about it though, is also her ability to, what I like about her, her writing is that it really weaves a very visual picture of setting. And so as an architect and as an artist, you can read her books and you just have this you're right there. You, 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 you believe the environments that she's created for these characters to interact in. And so this sketch is, is, is that homage to a building that I've wanted to go because I love the city. This is in, set in San Francisco and the interview with the vampire is set in San Francisco and you know, some scenes in other, other locations, but this, this house is of particular interest in the book and it's an actual house, Victorian, very classic inner city, San Francisco house. And uh, so this existed and it was one that she was familiar with. And so she based the, the house that's in the book on this particular residence. And so it's sort of become a historic landmark for, for those, for obvious reasons. But I just decided that I would find a picture. And as we've talked about, it's on those, those list of places that you would, you know, want to go and see. And so it just seemed, seemed like a good sketch. And, and it had, the photo I found had a neat vantage point. So I, I kind of, kind of leaned into it and tried to try some different techniques actually. And, and it, it just not to you know, belabor it, but it was, I was doing a lot of work on historic structures for work at this time. And so it sort of weaved in really, really good mm. um, with things that I was already sort of focused on and in trying some different techniques and sort of rendering things there and brought them over here. And I think I'm, I'm pretty pleased with it. Uh, there's, there's aspects of it that don't, it always sort of bug you, but. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's. Well, that I don't see. I mean, I'm not, there's nothing that bugs me, <laughs> but the, yeah, it's, it's nice to see. I, I want to, before I talk about a couple of the details in this sketch, I want to tell a little interesting story that I have a connection to interview with a vampire with, 
Uh, and then we can segue because we have one more sketch that we wanted to relate this this sketch to as far as technique. We, we've mentioned in the past that I had a, a worked with a Stan Winston back when I worked in California. And I did some design work to remodel a house of his. And as a, as a bonus, he invited me to his studio. It's, and I've told you about this, right, Jim? Yeah. Yeah. And so... Uh, Walking around, but it's but it seems like an ever like like a gift that keeps on giving. Which I can imagine his studio being that kind of a place where you're like, oh yeah, and mm -hmm. oh yeah, and there was this other thing. Um, exactly. So I'm excited. I'm excited. I'm exactly. Excited. Exactly. So, so without without further delay, I guess. So we're in his conference room, which I mean, yes, his conference room becomes this. Oh, and, and, and it's basically surrounded by all of his creatures that he's created in the various movies. Like, so, so the table's in the middle, long conference table, and then there's these sort of, these three tiered platforms and, and a surrounding the whole thing is the costumes of the characters, right? So there's all kinds, we talked about Danny DeVito in Batman Returns. So there's that. But there's also a Tom Cruise vampire. And I don't know if you knew, but he worked on uh, interviewing with a vampire, the movie, for a very specific scene. And it's the scene. So the, the costume or the, the creature that he created is posed in the scene at which Tom Cruise is dying. And so he's kind of crawling on the ground. So he's down, the character's down on the ground. And so Stan Winston created a, an animatronic robot character version of Tom Cruise. So he, I mean, it's a perfect, I mean, it's kind of a decaying face. It's sort of half vampire, half Tom Cruise and the makeup artistry on, on his characters really, I mean, everything he did, I mean, it's like perfect copy of of the human character the real people that he that were the actors and and so what he told me the story that stan told me was that in the movie as the character is dying it's they filmed it with tom cruise and then they filmed like the very finish of it with his robot and it edited together as seamless Right. So like you can't tell when it becomes when it stops being human Tom Cruise to robot Tom Cruise. And so he's got that animatronic thing, like still very creepily posed in his conference room. And I pointed it, I was like, I didn't know that you did interview with a vampire. He's like, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You that scene and then he goes into it. And it's just it's so cool that. I don't know. It was very cool to see, like we've talked about getting to go behind the curtain, behind the scenes and, and then hear all the stories from the late, also the late, great Stan Winston. So he's no longer with us. So I feel very lucky to have had that opportunity in that space. And so I'll say some of the other care we'll, we'll talk about, we'll, I'm sure we will talk about some other characters, but that was one that definitely stood out in that space. And it, it makes me want to rewatch, you know, the movie. Oh yeah, for sure. Know, and, and maybe reread re the book from, from Anne Rice. But so anyway, so, so that's my little aside anecdote. And then with, with this, with the sketch of this house, which was a very classic San Francisco Victorian, you know, row house. I don't know. Uh, is it a painted lady? Is it yeah, kind of one of the painted lady type, and 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 there's a, and I think that that's the one thing that I was I was sort of struggling with was that there's an intricacy of the patterning details in not just deep relief. So like at the cornice near the near the parapet, there's a lot of as elements are built up, and so you can get that shadow depth, and then also sort of draw in a lot of the detail work. But what I found challenging as well was that there were flat panel locations and then also stained glass insets that also had a pattern in and of themselves, which I thought was really fascinating to see all happening on a, on a relatively small elevation. But it, I just, it's that extra pattern work that's all when it's, 
there was less depth of field, so less room for creating the shadows to create the effect. I, I, I found that a little bit difficult. It, it works in the sketch. I um, mean, you pick up on the pattern, but I think mm -hmm. I probably could have executed it a little bit differently. But sometimes, uh, with sometimes with a good sketch, is what's not there that makes it a good thing. And and one thing I noticed right away is I'll hover my mouse over here, but the down the lower lower corner, well, the diagonal sketch with the lower corner, and we have this this heavy heavy line that profiles a stoop or some other structure, I think you, you will tell us what it was, but it's nice to see just this void of white because we have a very animated and textured sh shadow of a space between buildings and the cornice, like you mentioned, and the gable. And then we have this sort of clean white sort of relief. And, and, and so it, it has a nice balance as you have the base and then the, the, space above where in this case jamie did not render the sky it's what right. so unlike some of his other favorites of mine with you know a, a very moody sky render this case it's there's no no render so so that's that's one thing i think that strikes uh, a nice balance on this on this page and it's another one point like it's, mm. it's another, it's another one point, which is sort of, I mean, I, I was checking all the boxes on this one <laughs> for getting out of my comfort zone. And yeah, the, the, but the space down below was in this particular case was the one piece of the, the architecture that had been altered over. Time. So sometimes these were garages or accessory dwellings or storage spaces or accessory commercial units kind of at, at the street front. Because you remember that in San Francisco, for those who are sort of trying to picture it, like us using words to try and generate the image here, you can imagine the Painted Lady kind of Victorian houses and sort of the, the topography of San Francisco with the streets. And so a lot of these multi-level Victorians, as, as the streets ascend, they have some steps. And so there's a sometimes space at the street level for a very small, to really kind of activate the sidewalk. And so mm -hmm. in, this, in this particular case, that was there. But I, I decided to focus more on the, the residents as opposed to the, the, the building in front. And like you say, kind of tried to establish a balance on the page between sky and, and foundation. And I, I think it works. And then, of course, kinking the book to, to really kind of emphasize it, elongating it a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, and there's a layers, right? You have the, the front layer, which is very white, the main event in the middle, and then in the background is back to white. And so even though it's it's basically the blank page, it still kind of reads as a, a third layer beyond. And uh, let me let me quickly switch over to a follow-up here because what what we thought was a nice or a tie in or a segue, I guess, is, or maybe it's just me, and then you can tell me if I'm wrong. But the, the way you've rendered these trees against this concept or two concepts of a building actually is really nice. It kind of, you know, the silhouette of the tree is there, but you don't need every single leaf and twig and opaque the opacity of a solid tree to, to make the the scene because in actuality what you're trying to do is sell a couple of ideas for this particular building restoration right because there's a couple of different facade moves that you're doing that you would not see <laughs> if you had just drawn the tree <laughs> well it's and, like and it's... Oh, sorry i was just gonna no, say go what i teach you know my students is to kind of think you know, think on the fly a little bit and, and, and adapt, right? I mean, this is not the sort of training of, of how to render a scene. You, there's no by the book, right? That you say, okay, well, the building and then it's covered with trees and there's people and then, and you're done. Because if you did that, you wouldn't see the building. And how do you utilize, you're, you're, you're getting extra mileage out of two sketches that could maybe take four or more if you had to take the, vegetation away from the or sketch. have to or have to develop multiple views of the same facade mm -hmm. and you're really trying to maximize effort in this particular case it's a corner and 
And just as, as you were describing it, I really appreciated you sort of, you know, thinking through it as a design problem, because it, it in fact was, is this particular building from, it's sort of a, it's this two level struggle with almost a Romanesque type or a neo-Romanesque kind of base on the front corner. And, and that's original. That, that whole piece on the bottom is actually all original. And then even the, the, the stone elements on, the, on the, the corners and the columns are all original. Storefront's been modified a little bit that's sort of recessed on that first level, encouraging them to try and restore elements of that. But, but effectively, it's, it's in the same sort of configuration that it's always been activating the street on the corner. But from that mid belt of the building, up to the actual cornice and to the, the the upper portions of the facade, though it's also obscured by street trees that have grown up over time. And it's nice to have the street trees for sure to kind of create that synergy of outdoor space, that public domain and sort of the, the you know, a walkable downtown, all that's, all those are good things. But as those trees were also obscuring the facade, in this particular case, as we see in a lot of our old downtowns is there were periods of time when slip covers came into play. And so instead of oftentimes preserving and restoring or repairing upper facades, they would, because those openings were there, the windows were there, more elements, architectural elements, details, architectural details, brick elements, stuccoed elements, decorative cornices, all those things were oftentimes on these buildings, but some of those would deteriorate over time. And so it was a maintenance problem. So sometimes in, in those instances, they would cover them up uh, and they would cover them up with a new material. Or as they were, what was more often the case is that as they would think about modernizing the bottom storefront, they would also modernize the area above that and treat it like a billboard in a sense. Mm -hmm. And so they would take on a large area for signage, but also sort of simplify the structure and sort of streamline it in a way that hearkened to new technologies uh, and sort of new aesthetics that were sort of 50s, 60s, 70s aesthetics mm -hmm. of buildings. Um, and that's, and that's not that they were necessarily trying to strip away details, but it was the aesthetics were changing. And so in an effort to modernize them, modernize these shells, these buildings, these containers, they would oftentimes cover up a lot of the very, very intricate details that we now really know we, we can appreciate and celebrate. And mm -hmm. sort of that, that juxtaposition of old and new and restoring the old and kind of holding on to it and then inserting new things into it and kind of that, that play between the two elements it takes a little bit of design work, takes a little bit of creativity and thinking and careful analysis. What was going on with those slip covers is they were sort of just sort of putting a, an extra, a second skin on things. Mm -hmm. It's fortunate from the standpoint that they oftentimes didn't demo the things that were behind it. So in, in essence, they're giving us the opportunity now to kind of reinvestigate those things. Uh, in this particular case, this building, when the slipcover gets removed, some of the architectural elements have been eroded over time. The openings are there, but it's sort of questionable if, if other things have happened. And then there's also the, the there's, no there's no historic photographs of this building. So we're not entirely sure what's kind of going on on the upper level. So in this particular case, the reason why there's two sketches is to use the geometry and the form of the building to suggest, and then the evidence of the things that we were able to find, suggest two alternative design directions that would be historically for the design, but at the same time would all be rendered in newer materials so that you're, you're not confusing things as to what's what's original, original, and and what's been done in, in the present day, mm -hmm. yeah, that's... And, and and making the trees transparent allows a lot of those things to occur. Just like the slip covers themselves were hiding things, the trees were also sort of hiding a lot of things about this building and obscuring the big big signage that. 
that slip cover was supposed to be helping with. And that sign at that level is more about the car than about the pedestrian and the street at the, at the end of the day. And so rethinking those things and reevaluating kind of brings us to where we are with, with the sketches. Yeah. No, that was really a nice, oh, sorry, my feedback or hopefully, hopefully the thing doesn't record the feedback. We'll see. Cause it just makes my life a little more challenging when trying to, to edit these things, but no, thanks for the brief sort of explanation of, of how these buildings do change over time. And, and even considering the, the growth of trees from smaller smaller scale street trees and then they get mature and then they start to create this whole other texture to the to the scenery the space the, the street life it reminds me there is a building here in flint that there is photographic evidence but the building is so it's currently occupied by like a county services kind of facility but it was a former buick dealership for the mm -hmm. city of Flint, which has is two stories. And I believe it was built even with the capacity to have cars on the second floor. Somehow. It was actually actually pretty common. I, I, I was surprised to learn that in a lot of our cities as well with some of those buildings that had an automobile kind of function. And you know it, it doesn't it sort of seems counterintuitive today back then. That's the way a lot of them were were designed for a multitude of reasons. So yeah, I, I'm I'm not surprised. That sounds cool. Yeah, I'm gonna have to dig up some of the. I, I have a friend in the in that in that neighborhood. <clears throat> excuse me. That I think has some of the the photos of it. But the so basically, it's the same thing. Is it? The, it's a super beautiful corner building that has all this detailed columns. And I mean, it's it would be an early what 19 probably 30s maybe slightly sooner if it was Buick trying to get his, his stuff out there as, as quick as possible. But it's been reclad in what we call EFIS, so Exterior Insulating Finishing System, EIFS. For those that know, it's, it's sort of like a pseudo stucco. It's foam panels with a, a, a sort of cementitious stucco-like material and it, it and it basically is wrapped this entire thing in this gray, <laughs> this dull gray stuck ethos material. And some of the panels have actually fallen off. And and there have been, you know, a couple of people over the years that want to totally pull all that stuff off and restore the original building, but it, it's definitely gonna be an expensive endeavor. And I would well, love to see that happen though. Well, and in, in, in a lot of those cases, and just like the, with the slip covers, it's to, in today's world, if you had a historic building that maybe had this upper level with windows and details and things like that, there might be a, a situation where somebody comes in and says, oh, well, I'm going to, I'm going to modify this building. And in those cases, they would just start blowing out open and removing material. And, and demoing things and altering it significantly and drastically that way, what at least we're fortunate to, to have with when they're slip covered or in, your, in the case you're talking about with the EFIS, they're sort of encapsulating the building. <laughs> sort of that sort of they're putting it under glass, I wish, but they're, 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 they're putting it with this sort of protective shell. It's like that. Do you remember? And here's, here's the, we haven't had one of these in a while. Do you remember? Like this may be like elementary school, how awesome this was. Magic shell. Did you ever get magic shell or like go to that one friend's house who had magic shell? Like you'd get ice cream and then they would like have the, the, the chocolate sauce that you would pour on the ice cream and it would come out liquid from the bottle. But there was some oh. probably oh. terrible ingredient in there <laughs> that would, it would, it would become like a hard shell. And it was just fascinating that like, oh, it's liquid. And then it becomes like a, <laughs> like a hard yes. shell. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's, imagine that's what they're doing with these buildings in, mm -hmm. in, in, in the way back is they're putting this magic shell on, on the building. So the real building is still underneath there. Mm -hmm. It's just that the trick though is, is in, in their execution, did they damage 
the building to put this outer shell on. And that's, and that's usually the, the hard part to convince a new owner about is, you know, no, you can, you can peel back layers and you can, you can open up certain small sections and take a peek and see how they maybe did it because it's really, it's the anchoring. It's the Mm -hmm. anchoring of that outer skin to the inside. And if they did it in a, a relatively straightforward way, there might be ways to repair it. But then in other cases, they might have chipped away at tons of material and, and really made a, a mess of what's underneath. So I think the regrettable part of, of some of these types of rehabilitation projects, but like you were just describing, when you see photos of these buildings and you, and you can maybe get some hint that some of that's still there, that's, that to me is that's enough uh, of an opportunity for some detective work um, architecturally to imagine a, a new future for it. And that's what, and that's what this project was. It's very apropos, apropos of the Christmas season. It's like unwrapping a present, but it is, that's a nice little segue or what's, what, what's the, not a segue, but analogy. Put a bow on that, it. Yeah. You just put a bow on it. Put a, just bow, put a bow on it. it. Yeah. yeah. I, yeah, I'll have to, I'm going to dig up those pictures, but yeah, thanks for this two sketches actually really kind of drew out a really interesting conversation about preservation techniques and, and, you know, consideration of buildings. So, but before we go, I know you and I both wanted to just drop this hint because we're probably going to do a little homework, but here we are today, today, as we record this is matrix resurrections day yes it is which i i can't believe how long it's been i remember when we were when we saw the first tease of of a a possibility of this movie (laughs) oh and 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 we just the two of us were like like kids in a candy candy store like (laughs) We, we had so much like magic shell ice cream in thoughts in our minds and Christmas presents and bows and unicorns. And yeah, it was all kinds of fun. When did, when did you, do you remember when you first posted this one? So this, was, this is a repost of, yeah, this a, is a, repost. of a great yeah, Trinity this sketch. Is, I, I, I knew, I couldn't remember how far back it was. So I had to like do a little scrolling, but it was April, 2020. Oh, so that must have been when, and that was the original, right? The first, the when you actually sketched it, right? Yeah, this, yeah, this sketch is an OG sketch, yeah. So, so then, um, so then that must have been when they announced. I think so. The new movie. So there you go. I, you've, you've, you've answered my, my, my conundrum. So yes, over a year. We have, we have had to wait, but today's the day. Today's the day. I'm very excited. Yeah. So yeah. what we're going to do is we're going to watch the movie and maybe be text commentary, commentating to each other possibly. <laughs> <laughs> and then we're going to get back on the, the, the Zoom records and, uh, and do a little recap of, of a little piece of sci-fi. What's the word? Canon. Some yes. sci-fi canon. Absolutely. And and talk about how the new the new matrix fits in with the old trilogy and and, and maybe this sketch will have some new meaning after that. Yeah. And 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 I think the question will be like, were there tears shed in watching this movie? <laughs> so possibly. Yeah, I'm not crying, you're crying. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, man. All right. Thanks a lot.